much. Thank you very much. And first of all, I would like to thank Higami and the entire team for all the help and not least this effort to bring together a cosmos of knowledge, including painting, poetry. And during this one and a half day, let's say, a lot of questions rise, of course. What is cosmopolitanism? May we call it transculturalism? May we call it multiculturalism? Or may we call it conviviality, convivencia? So another question might be, and I would keep it for the discussion, um, whether cosmopolitanism is it a bygone past, or should it be an utopian effort for all of us in order to overcome sectarian, or let me say, dualistic concepts of life? Uh, in his study, The World, the Text, and the Critic, Edward Said emphasized that Istanbul represents a terrible Turk as well as Islam, the scourge of Christendom, the great oriental apostasy incarnate. Istanbul was also the city which nourished the fiction of the harem on which a despotic sultan was enthroned, thus sometimes on European white female slaves. Mozart followed a long tradition going back to the first Spanish theater plays of Cervantes, like El Trato de Achel, the slave of Algiers, where Maria was imprisoned in Algiers by the cruel infidels. In Mozart's abduction from the Seraglio, Constanze and the English blonde prevail finally over Osman the Turk and Selim the renegade, heralding the more colonialist than enlightened ambitions. The renegade is a prototype of a cosmopolitan figure with European background in Istanbul's 19th century. As an apostate, the renegade evoked also fear. The banyo, where the Europeans, mostly prisoners of war, were lodged, was located along the Golden Horn and this, uh, the, that's also beginning of the 19th century. It was equipped with three chapels and clergymen. Quite often, these prisoners converted to Islam, then serving most often in the Ottoman army. Zietzen met several of the renegades, Dönme, from Hungary, Hanover, or elsewhere. So the Hungarian Anton, who had German parents, and then became Mustafa, who was called by his comrades Türkçe Bilmes Mustafa. Orientalism, uh, and these images are quite known, and we had uh, at the first day already um, Jean Etienne Lyotard. Orientalism overshadowed the reality of cross cultural and cosmopolitan cities in the vast territories of the Ottoman Empire with an imagination of an oriental Islamic despotic entity. Such monocultural and monoconfessional one-dimensionality was far from the daily life experience, made not least by several travelers or painters who lived for years in Constantinople, like Jean-Étienne Lyotard, and he continued to live uh, a la Turca, as we heard uh, already, and whose paintings witness to a much more sensible perception, especially so if we compare these with the fantasies of violence by Jean-Léon Giraud on the right side, the white female slave. Ulrich Jasper Seetzen, the traveler from North Germany, who took a flat in Para in December 1802, uh, gave, us a, gave us an astonishingly literal and precise insight into the structure of the harem during the reign of Selim III, and we heard also today in the field of music he composed 
I think, 40 pieces of classical Turkish music, while underlining the preeminent role of the Sultan's mother and the Kahya, the administrative authority of her affairs, and regarding any decision making. But as the harem was only one small microcosm, which did not influence so much the daily life in Ottoman Istanbul, we will not come back to this microcosm and as well orientalist genre again. In order to break out of the imminent and closed circle of orientalist discourses, the rereading of travel literature, thereby filtering out traces of a rich mosaic of cross and transcultural interlacing, which is so characteristic for the Ottoman cosmopolitan capital, might widen the horizons beyond Orientalism. Ulrich Jasper Seetzen's diary sets a good example for studying the cross-cultural topo topography of Istanbul at the beginning of the 19th century. And here I want to uh, bring into the discussion one theoretical approach by Thomas Bauer, currently developed, which is a promising theoretical frame which enables to reconstruct the cross-cultural plurality not only in the Ottoman capital, but in all the cities in the empire's territories, thus even before the Ottoman Caliphate, which we discussed already as the concept of convivencia, which and maybe we should remember it's a long tradition tracing back to Al-Andalus and was discussed from Americo Castro in the exile, for example, during the Franco uh, period, remembering this flourishing multi cross-culturalism in Al-Andalus from 711 till 1492. The tolerance of ambiguity, a concept which Bauer derives from psychology, applied on cultural studies including linguistic sciences, literature or architecture, was a cornerstone in societies belonging to the wider Islamic world or culture before the emerging of European concepts of ethnicity and nationhood, which required a narrow definable affiliation or belonging. While erasing tolerance progressively, such one-dimensionality did not allow ambiguities, pluralities or vagueness. With the invention of race, the hierarchization of human beings introduced the pseudo-scientific demands of imperial world dominance. Bauer clarifies cultural ambiguity as the acceptance of a plurality of discourses, and here I quote, cultural ambiguity is present in, if in particular societal, societal areas, different discourses exist side by side, having in the meantime a power to set norms or standards of the subsystem. Here often the specific norms are incompatible. It is decisive that this coexistence is accepted by many. This is exactly the phenomenon of cultural ambiguity which reflects theoretically the cross-cultural topography of Constantinople written down in Seetzen's diary. We find in Istanbul at the beginning of the 19th century a mosaic of communities. Are these Turks, Arabs, Kurds, Greeks, Armenians, Wallachians, and Roma people? This multifarious world of beliefs, Islamic varieties of Orthodox, Armenian Christians, and Jews, beside a Catholic and a Protestant congregation, a large number of different Sufi paths. This topography of varieties follows often the historical and sociological structure of the old city where urban spaces were inhabited uh, by specific guilds who were equipped with a public bath or schools based on the native language. These places had no clearly outlined boundaries, nor in space, nor in time as one day could have been dominated by one community, 
celebrating a, re a religious festival, before the next day might another one shape the street's scenery. Ulrich Jasper Seetzen, The Diary and the Historical Context. Ulrich Jasper Seetzen from Jever in northern Germany was a natural scientist and, and became a specialist in Oriental studies. After his dissertation in botanic, a doctorate was conferred to him at the University of Göttingen in 1789. Together with several colleagues, among them Alexander von Humboldt in South America and Friedrich Hornemann in Africa, inspired him to set off in the direction of Constantinople, reaching the capital together with his traveling companion Ernst Jakobson on the 12th of December in 1802. His main patron was the Duke of Gotha, for whom he compiled a collection of manuscripts and natural produces. He stayed for half a year in Istanbul, where he wandered through all parts of the town, before he continued his journey to Aleppo, and then via Palestine to Cairo and Mecca. He died on his way to Sana'a in 1811. The diary, often kept meticulous, is an impressive testimony, not least for Constantinople's cross-cultural cosmopolitanism. The travel of Seetzen in the direction of Constantinople coincident, coincided with the French-British peace treaty of Amiens in 1802, a consequence of the French defeat in Egypt. Egypt remained into, in the Ottoman Empire. Large parts of the French army were shipped to Haiti, where they tried to repulse unsuccessfully the Black Slaves' Revolution. The impact of the revolution on the continent was described by von Humboldt, who was at this time in Venezuela. It is astonishing that Seetzen was informed that the revolutionary leader, Toussaint Louverture, was jailed at a French castle. In 1802, the American fleet took positions along the Libyan coast, escalating the so-called Tripolitanian War. Istanbul was pest-ridden. The Black Death spread into, in the metropolitan area. In these days, traveling from Galata to Bebek by a horse car took around two hours. Seetzen was fully aware of the danger caused by the epidemic, but also that he would not have been able to see anything in the city if he would rely on the advices given by the Europeans whom he called Franken Franks. So he continued unworried his daily tours, often funeral processions, processions which are always depicted in all details, passed by his windows of his small flat in Pera. We learn about the composition of the procession and to which community the deceased person belonged to. He also describes cemeteries um, with a different, with, with different gravestones. This is an Ottoman female, but he also described uh, Armenian gravestones and several other ones. Only one time he doubted whether the deceased was a, was a Christian or a Jew, because no cleric accompanied the procession. Later, Seetzen wrote in addendum, he was an Armenian who died in consequence of a malignant fever but not the Black Death. Also, the wedding processions were visualized picturesque. Quote, in our neighborhood, a young Armenian couple celebrated their wedding. At half past one, the bridegroom passed by our flat. A young man dressed ceremonially went ahead. He was followed by three musicians. One played the small violin to the tambour. Seetzen does not lack the detail in the music, the sequences of the procedure, or the customs with their colors and specific manners to wear these. From time to time, Seetzen immerses into multilinguistic, multilingual acoustic spaces. Quote, this alley was very lively and crowded. We saw a large variety of nations and clothes. 
The tangle of sounds was consisted of single words and fragments of phrases of Greek, Turkish, Italian, Slavic, French, and less frequent German languages. Sometimes he himself was addressed in Russian. The language of the embassies was French, which holds true not only for the Prussian ambassador, whom Zeltsen met from time to time. As a result of the long trading relations with Venice and Genoa, Italian terminology was used in different terminology, for example, for the Seccino, a gold coin printed in Venice since 1280, which later, with a hole in its center, became a jewelry. Seetzen was told that he has, has to ask for the Ustaria, Italian Osteria, the trading house he was looking for, and Uskuda on the Asian shore of the Bosporus situated opposite to per Pera and Beulu on the European side is mentioned as Scutari. Yes. Oh, this is a Medach, it's another. Rowboats, Gondeln, steered by a gondeliere, Turkish kaik, often Jews living in Husköy, plied between the shores of the Bosporus and on the Golden Horn. Yeah, it's a comparison and this image is from the Abdullah Freya. This is uh, the photographers of Abdul Hamid. But here the impression should not be created that mainly Para and Galata, often home to Europeans, their embassy, coffee houses, etc., were the center of cross-cultural interlacing. The varieties of cross and transcultural spaces were more universal. Also, the beggar was an Ottoman cosmopolitan. Zetsen mentioned the blind beggars citing partly Turkish, partly Christian Carmen or Greek prayers. Not least, we have to realize that the cosmopolitan dimension of the East played not a less important role in the Ottoman capital. This holds true not only for the Persian style to smoke the nargile, here Kalyan in specific coffee houses, the written language of the Ottoman Empire was Osmanli, the alphabet Arabic Persian. Zetsen was learning Ottoman and Arabic with enthusiasm. In these days we would have encountered in Istanbul not only traders from the Arabic provinces or the Maghreb, but also from Persia, India, Central Asia and Russia. These languages were also present in the Ottoman cosmopolitan Constantinople. The city stands for a unique Eastern-Western cosmopolitanism. And we should, of course, include not only this long trading or long distance traders communities along, we find them in Bukhara, Samarkand, and even in cars and other spaces, but which had been mentioned as well, this cosmopolitanism from below. So cosmopolitanism has, of course, also a social dimension when, and it had been mentioned, sailors for especially, uh, especially are one uh, part of it. So I think I do have only five minutes more, so I will exclude a part of it. In these days, celebrated an exceptional culture was celebrated an exceptional culture of feast days. For example, 6th of January. Today there was a feast day for three of the local religion, religious communities. The Catholics celebrated Epiphany, the three kings. For the Protestants, the feast of Christ and the Greek Christmas or the day of Christ. 13th century. Today the Greeks celebrate New Year. Early in the morning we heard the boys on the alley. Maybe, the maybe to felicitate each other. However, a feast nearly never is apparent because the religious groups differ so much and if one group goes celebrating, the other one continue their daily business. And Easter is a very nice example also. The multi-religious calendar of festivities went hand in hand with the ambiguity of tolerance. Several thousands had gathered around the Greek and Armenian cemeteries in Pera. The crowd, Sitzen wrote, consisted of nearly all religions and nations of the Turkish Empire. Men, women, children, rich and poor were together in most colorful melange. melange. It seems that everything was enlivened by unalloyed, unalloyed glee and joy. Eastern Constantinople became a festival of cultures 
so colorful portrayed by Sitzen. So, and to conclude, I think Sitzen is maybe one sample of, let's say, beyond Orientalism, because he approaches nearly without, let's say, prejudices, and he is, it's his first impression he writes down, not so much having this uh, uh, image of uh, Oriental despotism, and he gave a lot of samples, for example, also Islam might be an example regarding, um, uh, how do you say, cleanliness, huh? the daily bath. And we know that Urquhart, the British ambassador, he suggested for London the public bath in Istanbul as a sample, which also had been employed later for London. So far, thank you so much. Thank you.